Righty ho folks, so this is a presentation on Curly and I'm going to go through this presentation initially by thinking about this little mnemonic toast. Um, so when we think about toast, what we're thinking about are five distinct things that help develop a character. The first one is the T and it stands for things they do. So things that the character will do within the play or novella, in this case it's our novella of Mice and Men and how those things can allow you to understand the personality and perhaps the psychology of the character. O stands for other people's opinions, and that's really important in relation to Curly because you never really understand Curly um, from his perspective. He never opens up. Um, so you understand Curly's wife because she does open up in Chapter 5, but Curly is a closed book. And so what we have to do is think about his actions and think about what other people say. A is for appearance and that's important in relation to Curly when we find out when we look at section 2, chapter 2. S is speech, what they say and how they say it and again that's important in relation to how Steinbeck presents Curly and the final T of toast is their thoughts and feelings. Now because Curly is that closed book we have the third person narration we never find out how Curly is really thinking from his perspective and therefore that one isn't going to be as important. But Toast is a good way to remember how to look at a character and it's an easy way for you to think about five important things that help develop characterisation. So let's Toast Curly. Righty ho, so let's think about Steinbeck and what he does to present characters. The first thing that I'm thinking about here is the use of the nickname Curly. So Curly is called Curly, but it's not his real name, it's a nickname. A nickname that he was probably given in his youth. And therefore, the fact that he hasn't grown out of that links him to a level of immaturity. It's an epithet. An epithet is a descriptive name or phrase that's given to you as a substitute for your real name. And the idea that he is referred to by this epithet, epithet by everyone on the ranch suggests that he is a character who in himself is not seen as important. He has not got the status and the gravitas of his father. The fact that Curly has authority really lies in his connection to his father rather than anything that he has innately. He doesn't have the innate authority of someone like Slim with his calm godlike eyes, who's the metaphor prince of the ranch. If he is if he is um if he is respected, and I don't think he ever is respected, but if others are wary of him, it is because of who he is, his father's son, and the type of person he is, a scrappy fighter, not because of his quality or his worth. So therefore it is appropriate that he has a name, Curly, that is a nickname that in itself reflects a lack of important, importance or a casualness. Um, he is not a character who is um, valued for what he can do or how he affects others in a positive way. He is always seen in a, in a way where people resent the fact that he uses his father's status, that he uses his um, physical prowess in order to increase his own um, power and always belittle that of others. Okay, so <clears throat> when we think about Tolkien Curly, we think about the first thing, things that he will do, things that he does within the novella. So when we first see Curly, um, he adopts a stance that makes him appear a dangerous force. Oh, 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 actually, that's what I want. So he adopts a stance that makes him appear a dangerous force. So look at how Steinbeck uses verbs here. He stiffened and went into a slight crouch. His hands closed into fists. So the important things that the important thing that we want to take out of this is the use Steinbeck's use of verbs. So he stiffened. His hands closed. Immediately he takes on the stance of a fighter. Um, this word here is an important word. He's pugnacious. It's not a good word, pugnacious. And what we mean by that is that he likes fighting. He takes some sort of pleasure out of it. Um, and what he wants there is he wants to see uh, where he can be aggressive, 
where he can constantly assert himself. Remember, this need to assert himself comes from an inner sense of uh, insecurity. And we'll talk a little bit about that more. But what do you want to take from this? Well, when we first appear, when we first see Curly, Steinbeck uses verbs effectively to represent Curly as a dangerous force, as a man who constantly needs to assert himself physically. His pugnacious attitude, this desire to fight, is born out of a sense of inferiority. But that's not something that we learn until later on. And remember what Steinbeck wants us to do is he want, doesn't want us to judge these people immediately. He wants us to learn to understand them. So even somebody like Curly, who is a horrible man, he, you know, he is horrible. And yet, if we understand why he is so um, aggressive, why he is such um, an, a, a, a violent man, if we have an understanding that this is born out of something within himself that he knows is weak, that perhaps allows us to understand him a little bit more and not to condone him nor to be empathic towards him or even sympathetic but just to understand. Okay so again uh, when we first see him the things that he will do the things that he does his glance was at once calcul calculating and pugnacious that word that we had from um, the previous slide. So what we have here is, let's look at this phrase, at once, immediately he is on his guard. And this is an important little phrase, calculating and pugnacious. So it's not just about the physicality, but he's also trying to work out the logistics. He's trying to work out um, how he can manoeuvre the situation in a way that will al always allow him to win. So he has this cocky, confident attitude. He's immediately aggressive. He senses a threat and tries to calculate a way to overcome that. His glance was at once calculating and pugnacious. And so what we have here is Steinbeck foreshadowing that he will always immediately look for an opportunity to assert himself in an aggressive way. He's always reactive. He's always reacting to others. And that idea that his reaction will be instinctively be a violent one lends itself to this foreshadowing that Steinbeck uses that he's always going to be associated with violence and with danger and with conflict and we know that violence, danger and conflict will work together to rob George and Lenny of any hope of achieving their dream. So what are we taking from this? Let's take this phrase that at once he's calculating and pugnacious. The fact that he is strategizing as well as focusing on how he can be physically aggressive. They, those two things together let us know that he's always going to be reactive. He's always going to be associated with violence. He's always looking for a way to win. Okay, so our O stands for the opinion of others. Remember, Curly never speaks to us directly in terms of his thoughts and his feelings. Instead, what we have to do is we have to try and pick up on what Steinbeck is implying and look at how other people speak in relation to Curly. Here we have Candy. Candy is our is um, the role of the narrator or plays the role of the narrator within the the ranch. And what we have here is Candy giving us an insight into the type of person that Curly is. Because Curly has this small stature, because he's small, he's always going to overcompensate for that. He's always going to try and prove that he's stronger than those who are larger than him. And he always does this in an intimidating manner. Remember, he's at once calculating and pugnacious from the previous slide. So what does Candy say? Candy says, seems like Curly ain't given nobody a chance. And what we want to take from this is... What Curly does is he uses his height or his dad's protection um, to weaken others. He is a bully. That bully is that bullying sense of, of Curly Curly's personality or that, that sense that Curly is a bully, that is born out of an insecurity. An insecurity perhaps linked to his height. But what you have to realise is the fact that he is a bully cannot really be condoned by that. Steinbeck wants you to understand perhaps why he is the sort of man he is, but that doesn't excuse his behaviour. 
seems like Curly ain't giving nobody a chance. Now that's an, an important phrase. Curly has things covered in, in, in two ways really. One, because he's small, he overcompensates and he takes on the big guys and can always find a way to appear the victor because if he beats them, then it's a small guy beating a big guy. And if he loses, well, then the big guy shouldn't have, t- you know, shouldn't have exerted his power over somebody who was so much smaller. So he's always going to get the sympathy vote that way. Plus, he can't ever give anybody a chance or no one can ever um, can him because of who his father is. So he is protected by his um, aggressive manner and by the vicarious power or the power that he can uh, wield not because he deserves it but because he is aligned to his father and his father is the boss and therefore his father has a say in relation to who stays on the ranch and who goes. Oh look this is all uh, muddled up but it should be okay. So again Candy being the narrator tells us more about Curly, so the opinion of others is really important here. That's the boss's son, he said quietly. Curly's pretty handy. He done quite a bit in the ring. He's a lightweight and he's handy. Right, what have we got here from Steinbeck? First of all, you've got repetition of handy. Okay, he's pretty handy and he's handy. Remember, Steinbeck uses hands um, quite a lot throughout the novella, the motif or the roof. The recurring reference to hands is used for a number of characters, Slim, Curly and Lenny. And what we have here is the repetition of Handy being used to suggest something about who Curly is. It's used, first of all, by Candy as a warning, i.e. his fists are powerful, that he has a certain skill in the ring that means that he is a a fighter of some note. He is a fighter of some quality. But what's important here is the fact that Curly's hands are um, referred to in paradoxical ways in that his hands represent one the fact that he he has a, a powerful punch, that he has done quite a bit in the ring. But also his hands are used by Stem, Steinbeck to represent um, his innate weakness or his sense of inferiority. Remember, Candy will talk later on in the presentation about the idea of his, his glove is full of Vaseline, that he's keeping his hands soft for his wife. And what that does, it suggests a lack of masculinity, uh, the fact that he needs to rely on a fistful of Vaseline to keep his hands soft for his wife. It shows that he's overcompensating in some way. Another thing that we have here is the idea of lightweight and the implication of that. A lightweight is a term for a, a, a boxer who, who boxes at a certain physical weight. But also a lightweight can mean in terms of status that he is not someone who has in who who are engenders or who creates um, uh, an aura of respect wherever he goes. He's not like Slim. You know, if you think about Slim, Carlson holds open the door to allow Slim to proceed. Nobody's going to hold open the door for Curly in that respect. But because Curly doesn't have gravitas, Curly doesn't have a sense of authority that is innate and is respected by all. He is a lightweight. He's called Curly. He's still referred to by his boyhood nickname. Um, his status is only his because of the fact that he's his father's son. Another little thing about the repetition of Handy there, and remember repetition is your AO2, that's how Stenbeck is presenting can, uh, Curly, it's used as a warning <clears throat> because what we have here is Candy reinforcing the fact that Curly is a threat. Um, people are intimidated by Curly's position because he's the boss's son, not because of who Curly is himself. But that doesn't mean that he isn't a threat. He is a threat. Um, and therefore, we know when Curly's pretty handy um, that the threat that he represents will be felt most acutely by George and Lenny, who have got the most to lose. You've got it again, three times. Well, Curly's pretty handy, the the Swamper said sceptically. Never did seem right to me. Seems like Curly ain't given nobody a chance. 
And again, that idea that Curly will manipulate the situation to always get his own way. Remember back to the second quotation that at once he's calculating and pugnacious. And remember, calculating refers to the mind. Pugnacious refers to the physicality of Curly. And therefore, he's always manipulating a situation, either in terms of physicality, taking on big guys, or in terms of how he can manipulate the situation where he can always win. Can he use his own authority through his the fact that he's handy? Or does he use his father's authority um, through the fact that he's his dad's son? So Curly is a manipulator. He manipulates situations to get his own way. He always wins. And the fact that he always needs to win shows that he has this innate or within him he has this sense of insecurity. He can never really be challenged because he always engineers the victory. He never deserves it. It's never He never fights a good fight. It's always a victory that's engineered. And that links back to those two key words again, that he is um, calculating and pugnacious. And what Curly does is he will always make sure that if he is the victor, somebody will lose. And we know that the people to lose here will be Curly, or sorry, will be George and Lenny. Um, the question is, does Curly win in the end? That might be something that you'd like to ponder for a while. If Curly wants, if Curly's view of victory is that Lenny is dead, well then yes. But remember, Curly isn't the one who kills him. Curly loses his wife, but Curly never cared about his wife. Um. So the the idea of does Curly win? That's open to debate. You need to think a little bit about that. But the fact that Curly doesn't kill Lenny robs him of what he would love most, which would be the pleasure of doing it. And he never gets that. So we're still thinking of the opinions of others here. And this is Candy talking about Curly. Don't tell Curly I said none of this. He'd slimy. He just doesn't give a damn. Won't ever get canned because his old man's the boss. <coughs> okay. Candy's scared of Curly finding out what he's saying behind his back, the gossip that Candy thrives on. Um, the fact that Candy gossips shows his weakness and it shows again how he tries to ingratiate himself with others. He tries to give them tidbits of conversations. He tries to um, gossip behind other people's backs in, in order to win favour or to even just prolong the communication he has with others, um, a means of um, forestalling the loneliness that he feels. But here we have the idea that Curly just don't give a damn. It links to the idea that what he says in the previous slide, slide that it never seemed right. Um, and Curly just doesn't give a damn. The fact that he manipulates situations that we, we talked about earlier on, the fact that he manipulates situations um, comes down to the idea that his old man's the boss. He can never lose. He won't ever get canned won't ever get canned and that gives him um, an air of um, untouchability. He feels that he can do whatever he wants and he finds a way to manipulate the situation where he'll always win. Candy is intimidated by Curly even when Curly's not present to hear and Candy does believe or sorry Curly does believe he's untouchable. However not everyone is intimidated by Curly. Slim surely isn't and in chapter three, we find out how Carlson stands up to him as well. So Curly's, um, Curly's belief in the in him, Curly's belief in the fact that he can get away with whatever he wants to, is an erroneous belief. It's false, because the men understand that he is a lightweight, that he himself doesn't have the status, um, of his father, that he himself is not worthy of respect, that. Any authority that he tries to wield is somebody else's authority. And they find that laughable at times. And you, and you see that in chapter 3 when Carlson does laugh at him. Here you have George then talking about Curly and he says, I hate that kind of bastard, he said. I've seen plenty of them. Like the old guy says, Curly don't take no chances he always wins. Now that turns out to be prophetic in a way um, because George realises that 
Curly's authority is vicarious. It doesn't belong to him. It belongs to his father. And therefore Curly overcompensates with his own insecurities. He relies on violence. He relies on the fact that he's pretty handy. He relies on his aggressiveness to um, dominate others. And he always feels that he has to dominate them. And he always feels that he has to manipulate the situation, that even if he loses a physical fight, he still emerges a victor in the eyes of those watching because he had the pluck and the courage to take on the big guy. The idea about Curly always winning, again, it depends on what you see as Curly's victory. Curly's victory is Lenny's defeat. Well, OK, then Curly wins. Curly doesn't kill Lenny, though. Um, and Lenny um, is sacrificed in a in a a mean in a in a way to protect him. So, <coughs> what we have is again that question of does Curly win, and there is no right or wrong answer. You've got to come up with that one yourself. Right, folks. So let's look at the appearance of Curly because it's really important. Now. What we know about Curly is that he wore high heel boots and he's a young man with a brown face. Now, the important thing here is the reference to the high heel boots. There we go, more the high heel boots. Because what it does is it links Curly to an accessory. It links his appearance to the idea that he is trying to mask something or rather make something more obvious. He doesn't have the ability to command respect because of who he is and what he represents. He is not like Slim. And instead he wears high-heeled boots to perhaps suggest that he is tremendously insecure, that his height is an issue, that he's just a little guy in, in more, way than, more ways than one. Remember, he is a lightweight. Um, that idea that he carries little value um, in terms of who he is as a person. So the fact that he wears high heel boots is important because it shows that height is an issue, makes him feel in, um, inferior or insecure, that the authority lies in the boots and not the man. And that's important because someone like Slim, Slim can command silence with a look. Slim is the sort of person um, for whom Carlson will step back and open the door. Slim is the person that um, Candy looks to to save, to offer a glimpse of hope or to try and save his dog. Um, and remember that short sentence, and, and Slim gave none. Uh, his word is his bond and his word is the law. All of those things are lacking in Curly. He does not have the gravitas. And what I mean there is he doesn't have the importance. He doesn't have the moral weight uh, within him that someone like Slim does. And so what he does is he relies on accessories um, to make his status clear. So he wears his high heel boots to give him that air of authority. Remember, his dad wears high heel boots as well. Um, his dad is the boss. His dad has that power. Curly doesn't even have that power because he's not the boss. He's the boss's son. So Curly has, uh, Curly's link to power is really through his father. But what we have here is the idea that he wears the high heel boots to make himself feel better, to give the people on the ranch an idea that he is an authority figure. He dresses to make himself look more important. Now, what does that suggest? Well, does it not suggest how closely aligned his characterization is with his wife's? She dresses too. She dresses to fulfill her dreams. She dresses like a movie star and she's stuck on a ranch. And as incongruous and ludicrous as that is, she's doing it to make herself feel better because what it does is it allows her to believe momentarily that, that she is a glamorous young thing that um, can grace the, the stage or grace the silver screen it fulfills her dreams and what we have here is curly too in his high heel boots it makes him think for a moment that he too is a tall respected authority figure even though he is not any of those things so it's important to remember that accessories tell you as much about a person's psychology as they do about their um their fashion sense and here the idea that curly is 
wearing this high heel boots, that he's a young man with a brown face, he's out in the sun, uh, he's out on the ranch, uh, but he's not a ranch man, he's not physically powerful um, in terms of his, his ability to work. His physical power is only to not to create, not to produce wealth. His physical physical power is always linked to destruction and violence. Yeah, he's 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 not pleasant, is he? You wouldn't want to bring him home to meet your dad. Okay, so <clears throat> then we have his speech. And what we're thinking about here is not only the words that he says, but how he says these words. Okay, so when he meets Lenny, he's eager to start a fight with him. Why? Because Lenny's a big guy and he needs to prove he needs to prove that he is something by taking on a big guy. And remember, Candy's already told us that. So he tries to start a fight with him for fighting a man so much larger would prove Curly's physical prowess. And remember, he's always out to prove something. Um, he has this need, this urge to prove that he is something because in, he knows innately, he knows instinctively that he is nothing. So here we have speech, by Christ, what the hell? Now, here we've got blasphemous use of language. There's your AO2. So he uses blasphemous language. He uses derogatory language. He uses abusive language. He uses violent vocabulary, whatever way you want to phrase that. You have to mention it, folks, because that's your AO2. That's your technique in your Peter paragraph. So he uses this blasphemous language and the violence of his speech mimics his personality. And that's important. You know, he, he, he not only he talks the talk, he can walk the walk in that sense, but he's always doing it. Um, he's always doing it with um, a need to hurt and wound others and to make himself feel better by doing that. And he says, let the big guy talk. He says that to George. I'm going to have a wee drink of my coffee here. And look at that imperative verb, guys. There's your AO2, imperative verb. Let the big guy talk. So he uses the imperative verb to control that situation because he's walked into a situation where he's met two strangers and immediately he needs to control it. And again, that, that screams insecurity to you. So his status and authority is all based upon aggression and not respect. And that's why he is a foil. He is the opposite of Slim, whose authority is based on the fact that he is respected by everyone. Um, Curly doesn't respect Flim. F Flim? <laughs> Curly doesn't respect Slim, but he is scared of him. Righty ho. So let's look at Curly's speech here again when first meeting George and Lenny. Now, just before I get to the speech, let's look at this verb choice here lashed. Okay, now you're going to see more of that later on in chapter three when we get to the fight. But Curly lashed his body round by Christ. He's going to talk when he's spoken to. What the hell are you getting in for? Now that verb choice is important because it suggests in, in a way what it does is it links Curl, Curly's body to a weapon. He lashed it round like a whip. Um, so it not only tells you the, the speed um, of his movement, but it metaphorically links Curly's body to a weapon he, he, he's like a whip he um, immediately he fo he's focused on the the point where he feels he needs to defend or he needs to assert himself so Curly is aggressive and the implication here um, is that he he will wound you know like a whip will wound at its point of contact so will he um, so Curly is aggressive and the implication of the relationship between Curly and George lets you know that this is a relationship that is never going to end well. Curly and George are going to be, um, well, they're antithetical. They're, comp they're opposite characters in so many ways. George is, is a character who will become increasingly paralleled with um, Slim and Curly is the opposite of that. He's a foil to both George and to Slim. The relationship here is uncertain. It's precarious, i.e. there's that sense that danger is looming and we get a sense of foreboding in the way that Curly speaks to George through the um, the violence of his, his language, again, blasphemous there by Christ, but also Steinbeck's use of that verb, lashed, which metaphorically makes Curly seem like a whip, uh, a weapon. He uses his body as a weapon. Okay, let's look at the dialogue, AO2. So remember, folks, just use your AO2 terminology. And here you've got the dialogue. The dialogue is profane. Now, profane is another way of saying, um, linked to, to the idea of it being um, a blasphemy in that it is against um, the rules of ordinary behaviour, that it in some way has um, a religious connotation to it in that it is, um, uh, it is disrespectful of a religion. 
So the use of the Christ there, that's the second time that he's used it. It makes a speech uncivil and hostile. And remember, that reflects him as a person. He is uncivil. He is hostile. We don't like the boy. Um, and the drama of his reaction lies in the fact that he... Um, it believes that George is challenging his authority. And the key thing, the irony there, is that he doesn't have any authority. His authority is a vicarious one. It's through his dad, or his authority is there because all he does is be aggressive and belligerent and bellicose, and all he wants to do is fight. Um, and nothing that he ever does is about having uh, one modicum of decency within him. I don't like him. Okay, so thoughts and feelings. Now, remember that we won't get very much in relation to Curly's thoughts and feelings because Curly never tells us. <clears throat> Instead, what we do is we get them through um, Candy. Candy is the narrator character. And we get this one here. <clears throat> Curly says he's keeping that hand soft. And remember, this is a, the glove full of Vaseline. The fact that Curly has spoken to Candy about his sexual life, about the fact that he's keeping his sand, hands soft for his wife. Um, it suggests that, well, first of all, it's immature, really, isn't it? It's, um, George says, you know, that's a dirty thing. When he hears it from Candy, he says, that's a dirty thing to tell around. That um, George recognises it as dirty talk. He recognises it, uh, recognizes it as something that is... Um, just inappropriate. You, I suppose you could use the word salacious here. Um, salacious, which means an unhealthy interest in sexual things. And Candy, um, the fact that Candy's gossiping about it shows that there's a salacious element to him, but also that Curly is salacious. He has this unhealthy interest in, in his sex life that he would talk to others about what he and his wife um, maybe would would be doing when they're alone and remember his answer his pants are full of ants we don't think that he and his wife are doing anything when they're alone I think that's one of his issues but what it does suggest is that he feels he needs to tell other people that he needs to exploit the fact that he um has this potential sexual relationship um the fact that he talks about it shows that he wants to tell other people that he is potent that he's sexually powerful but he's not he doesn't. He's so stupid that he doesn't even get that. The fact that he has to wear Vaseline and a glove to appear p potent and sexually powerful, that is not. Th that is not saying that you know you're the man. And if anything, it is hinting at a level of insecurity that we've already seen within Curly. Um, what we have is the idea that he is. He's an immature, puerile. Let's write puerile down. Puerile character. Ooh. I wasn't expecting it to be yellow, but <clears throat> really that's what he is, childlike, boyish. And when we think about it, compare his um, compare his reference to his hand here, keeping his hand soft for his wife, with the description that Steinbeck has given us in relation to Slim's hands. Slim's hands have, the, you know, the natural delicacy of, remember, a, t um, a temple dancer, remember, um, of a temple dancer. So that metaphor there, comparing Slim's hands to a temple dancer, naturally, innately, despite the fact that he does rough manual labor every day, even though he does that, it hasn't affected him. His skin is still soft. He has that delicacy. He has that um, innate quality, quality that makes him... I suppose impervious to the the rough atmosphere in, in which he lives. Th that's interesting in itself, isn't it? That despite the fact Slim is out there in the sun, despite the fact that he's doing the the manual labour, despite the fact that he, you know, can whip flies off the back ends of animals, all of those things that he can do, it it doesn't change who he is. Um, it's almost as if he is. Um, impervious to the conditions um, in which he lives. And that's interesting because the conditions for the ranch house men are such that it, it embitters them, it hardens them. Think about how, how much um, life in the harness room has hardened and embittered a character like Crooks, yet it doesn't have that effect on Slim. In some ways, he can, he can, he's inviolate, he, he, 
none of these things permeate through to change who he is as a person. And I, do, I, I know I'm going off on one there, but really what I'm trying to say is the idea that Curly can never have that tender touch that Slim has. He could never have the delicacy, not only of movement, but of, of feeling that Slim has. Curly is always reliant on other things to try and prove that that he is someone worthy of respect or that he is someone that can be valued you know it's the vaseline that softens his hands it's the high heels that give him any sort of stature there's nothing really within himself that we can look upon and say yes that's a quality that can be worthy of merit okay so this is the fight and if you look at the fight, it's really important for you to look at the verbs associated with Curly because he's just associated with so many violent verbs. And there's our AO2. You know, that's what Steinbeck's doing here. We've already had the idea that Curly lashed. Remember, he lashed his body round initially when George tried to stand up for Lenny in, in chapter two. But here we have Curly whirled on, on Carlson. Um, we have Curly glared at um at Candy. Curly stepped over to Lenny. Curly's rage exploded. He slashed and smashed, slugging him. Now look at that. Isn't that great? Let's just remember these verbs. Slashed and smashed and slugging. Because what we have here are verbs that are almost onomatopoeic. On, oh, Matt, oh, Peter owns everything in Canada. Onomatopoeic. Um, they communicate the violence of his action, the, uh, the energy behind his aggression. They let you know just what a vital and violent force this wee boy is, this Curly is. And we have the idea that he's brutal and it's only intensified here by um, the use of the, the verbs that Steinbeck has attributed to him. He's the aggressor. It's very, very clear. And if you're going to mention the, the, those onomatopoeic verbs, you know, that's Steinbeck using oral imagery, A-U-R-A-L imagery, imagery of the ear, to communicate the violence, the aggression, the energy of this man. Now, it's important when you look at the, the fight to work out the steps within it. So, it's Carlson who attacks Curly, you know, Carlson laughs at him, that disrespect there. You can imagine poor Curly in his high heeled boots thinking that he is something and then Carlson just laughed at him. And look at the language here, the derogatory language, you goddamn punk, you tried to throw a scare into Slim and you couldn't make it Slim, Slim threw a scare into you. And that's the key thing, Slim did throw a, st a scare into Curly because Curly doesn't understand the kind of person that Slim is. He doesn't understand that there is a moral weight behind the character of Slim. Because in many ways, Curly, you know, Curly is ignorant. He's ob he's obtuse. He's deliberately stupid in that in that respect. And he doesn't understand what is of value in this world. And someone like Slim epitomizes everything that is of value in this world. Um, you're yellow as a frog belly. Now that's a great simile for. Curly, because he is, ultimately he is yellow as a frog belly, because he will only ever take on a fight where he can win in some respect. Even if he gets blathered by a big guy, he still won in the eyes of the, those who watch, because he was the wee guy who had the pluck and the prowess to take the big guy on. I'm sure the big guy shouldn't have been attacking somebody so small. So that idea of him being as yellow as a frog belly is important. The simile there lets you know that people understand, Carlson understands the type of character that Curly is and disrespects him because of that. Candy joining the attack with joy. Now we've talked so much about that phrase, particularly if you, it, we did it ages and ages ago when we were doing our controlled assessment. But if you watch the Candy video, um, we talk about that a lot. And then throwing up the glove full of Vaseline again and the disgust. And, you know, that just shows you the hypocrisy of Candy because, yeah, he's disgusted. Um, he said disgustedly throwing back the glove full of Vaseline. However, when he originally mentioned that to George, he warmed because of the gossip. Sorry, hold on. Here comes Alistair. So when you're watching this, you know that Alistair's coming into the room. Okay, so Alistair's away now. But uh, I can't even remember what we were talking about. Oh, yes, the hypocrisy of candy. Yeah, so he says disgustedly, glove full of Vaseline there. But yet he was the one who, who warmed to the gossip um, in, in chapter two. So it shows the hypocrisy, really, of the man. But then again, 
it also shows the loneliness. Gossip is his way to ingratiate himself um, with others, the way to maintain contact. And so for him, gossip is a lifeline. Anyway, let's not go off on one there again. So anyway, Curly glared at Candy, but he doesn't attack Candy. No, where does it go? Where does it go? His eyes slipped on past and lighted on Lenny. And Lenny was still smiling with delight with the memory of the ranch. Curly stepped over to Lenny like a terror terrier. Now, isn't that interesting? Steinbeck using two similes, um, two uh, animalistic similes to describe the same man. One, yellow as a frog, and that's what he is. But also two, steps over like a terrier, which is also what he is. So it shows the two sides of his personality. His aggression, the, you know, the, the idea that he is always willing to fight his pugnacious um and remember that, do you remember when the first time we, we saw him, Steinbeck says that his, um, his uh, describes him as being calculating and pugnacious, that his look is both calculating and pugnacious. Um, and what we have here is the idea that he's willing to fight, that he's aggressive, like a terrier, he's a, and remember a terrier is a small dog, that he's always nipping, that he's always on the attack. And he attacks Lenny. Why? Because he's calculating. He's calculating, okay, he's a big guy. I can take on the big guy because that way I'm always going to win. Um, I wanted to write um, a word down there for you. Hold on. Pugnacious. Okay. And again, reference to a pug dog, but hey, we'll not go there. But <clears throat> like a terrier, so he's yellow as a frog and he's like a terrier. So those two similes are great because they show you the, the, the two sides to Curly. And then his rage exploded. Come on, you big bastard, get up your feet. No big son of a bitch is going to laugh at me. Look at that. Twice he mentions big. No big son of a bitch. You big bastard. And that inner in that um, insecurity he has about his height, it's clear there. Lenny looks helplessly. And then Curly was balanced and poised like the boxer he is. That idea that he's calculating, he knows how to do this. And he slashed and smashed and slugged. And what we really have here is the idea of him as a bully. Um, he's a bully who will always look for a way to win. And picking on Lenny, the, the weakest here, the emotionally and psychologically, he is the weakest. Picking on this character here because he knows that even if Lenny attacks back, he will still be the he will still have been the one who took on the big guy. Oh heavens, right, well we've talked about this, <laughs> so I'm not going to go into it particularly. So yellow is a frog, animal imagery there, the simile commenting on his personality and his psychology, yep, innately a coward, yes. Um, and then the idea of uh, Curly as a dirty little rat, um, because Curly's practices as a boxer, he's, he, doesn't, he doesn't fight clean, he doesn't fight, fight fairly, instead... He attacks someone who's too frightened to defend himself. So it reduces his status to the lowest of the low, that he is a dirty rat. There, and there's nothing but contempt in Slim's rebuke. And remember, Slim is someone who who judges things as they are. He is our moral touchstone. So if Slim thinks that he's a dirty rat, then a dirty rat is definitely what he is. Right, again, I've talked about this, so I'm not going to talk about it too much. So like a terrier, that he's persistent, that he acts without compunction. There's nothing holding him back. You know, there, there's the fact that Lenny is, is desperate, the fact that Lenny is whimpering. None of those things stop the potency of Curly's blows. He's small, he's intense, he's persistent. And again, those two similes of the frog and the terrier show that both uh, both show the negative sides of Curly's personality. Is there a positive side to Curly's personality? I think you'd have to spend a long time looking for one and it might be a fruitless search. Right, but at the end of the fight, you have another simile related to Curly that he's flopping like a fish. Now, this is really important because this same simile about flopping like a fish is used to describe poor Curly's wife in chapter 5. It aligns the two of them. These two people are married, yet they never appear in the same scene together. They're always looking for one another or say that they're looking for one another, whether they actually are, I don't know. They never find each other. That's, for, that's the truth. The only time the Curly finds his wife is when she's dead. 
Um, so there are, there are not many things that you could say they have in common, but one, they both use accessories to fulfill their dreams, to make them appear to be people that they're not. And two, Steinbeck shows us this idea that they're linked with a, a, a sense of weakness or a lack of potency as people because they're both described using the same simile, flopping like a fish. And then flopping is repeated, flopping little man who's white and shrunken. And I think it's important when you remember in chapter, does Steinbeck like Curly more than Curly's wife? Well, one way that you could answer that question is how they're how they're described in their moments of their you know of their defeat. When Curly is beaten, when Curly's hand rather is smashed to a pulp by Lenny, Curly is flopping like a fish, yes. And then we have this phrase that he's a floppy little man, that he's white and shrunken. And what that does is it suggests in an unpleasant way the weakness and the lack of potency of Curly. There's no sympathy in that description of him. However, if you go back and look at the Curly's wife video in chapter five, when she dies, yes, she flops like a fish in Lenny's arms. That's true. But in death, she is natural and young. Um, you, ha you have that sleeping beauty analogy in her death, you know, that she's natural and young and all that ache and the loneliness and the ache for attention. Remember that little phrase for Curly's wife? All of that's has been drained from her so there is sympathy in the description of her in her final moments there there are no there are no um words used or phrases used here that you could say um suggest the same sympathy for curly so does steinbeck like curly's wife more than curly i think so right section five is really important for curly because we get to see just how horrid he is he is such a horrible man but here we get to see truthfully what is important to Curly and it's not going to be his missus. So there are five important things to remember when Curly sees his wife's body for the first time and we'll go through what they are. Okay so you have this short sentence Curly came to life. So when Curly sees his dead wife Curly comes to life. Isn't that a nice little bit of irony? Well what does it mean? What does it imply? Well it it creates this idea that the idea, it creates the idea, or it suggests rather, that to revenge himself upon Lenny invigorates Curly. It enlivens him. It's a vital force. So the idea of being able to be aggressive and to be violent is something that invigorates, revitalizes, energizes Curly. It allows him to suddenly come to life. So the idea of the idea of hurting somebody else actually is seen as a positive influence within Curly. It, it's something that um, is a catalyst that sparks life within him. And that's horrible, isn't it? T to, live, to live for hurting others, that's, that's a terrible way to be. So the possibility of revenge is something that is desired by Curly and he comes to life when he thinks of it. I've said it's situational irony and what I mean there is it's ironic that when presented with death, like he is with his wife, it actually enlivens him. Oh, I've done, I should, right, I'm trying to make this go on. Right. Then the second thing that he says is, I'll kill the big son of a bitch myself. And again, look at that. Yeah, big. That's where all issues lie. Um. People used to say this, the idea that if you were small and that you needed to assert yourself, that was a Napoleon complex. But having watched Horrible Histories, apparently Napoleon was five foot nine and that was average height at his time. So I'm not quite sure if they've renamed that. But anyway, I'll kill the big son of a bitch myself. Look at the language here. It's just filled with aggression. Son of a bitch, I'll kill the big son of a bitch myself. And what you have here is... He's referred to Lenny as the son of a bitch in, in the fight, remember? He refer referred to him as a big son of a bitch in the fight, and here he's son of a bitch again. But the violence here, I'll kill him myself, the violence here is such um, an energising force for Curly. It's his prime motivation. Violence and hurting others, they are his prime motivations. So it's no wonder that his wife didn't like him. It's no wonder that she told um, Lenny just at the start of this chapter that she doesn't like Curly, that he's, he's, he's not nice. Because violence and aggression are the things that he lives for. Right. <clears throat> 
third thing, I'll shoot him in the guts. Now, this is important too. Apparently being shot in the guts is the, the worst, um, most painful way to attack someone, to shoot someone, um, to cause a slow and agonising death, not, not anything quick, not anything clean. Um, and remember, Lenny does die quickly, he does die cleanly. Um, so I'll shoot him in the guts. It shows the vindictive power of Curly that he wants to maximise the pain, he wants to maximise the suffering, and I'll I'll be the one who does it. So far, we have not had one reference to his wife. It's all about him. So the death of her, what does that do? It invigorates him. It makes him feel potent and strong because he can be violent and vindictive, and these are the only things that he can actually bring to a situation. Here's your, his instructions then. Don't give him no chance, and he's referring to Lenny. Shoot for his guts, and that will double him over. So there you have the repetition in reference to his guts, that vindictive wound that he wants to inflict upon Lenny. Don't give him no chance. And remember remember what Candy said way back in chapter two? Seems like um, Curly ain't giving anyone a chance. Well, here you have it. He doesn't give anyone a chance. He certainly doesn't give Lenny a chance to protect himself. And what what he wants here is he wants he wants to cause pain. He wants to maximize suffering. A complete lack of compassion. Um, and it 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 really relates back to everything that we know about Curly. He always wins. He always gets his way, and he wants to get his way. And if you remember when I said to you, does Curly win? Well. If Curly's winning depends on Lenny's defeat, then yes. But he doesn't get the sort of defeat that he wants. Lenny doesn't suffer. Lenny dies quick. Lenny dies clean. He doesn't die in misery the way that Curly wants him to. And remember, that's not revenge for his wife. But none of this is spurred by a love for his wife. None of it is. And it's Slim who makes that clear. It's the omniscient Slim. Slim who knows everything, who understands everything. He's the one who knows that all this violence and all the vindictive power within Curly. It's all egotistical. It's always about him. Um, and here he is again. I'm going to shoot the guts out of that big bastard myself, even if I only got one hand. And we have that idea here. I'm going to, again, it's all about him. Big bastard. Again, rep rep repetition of the the dialogue, the dialogue that he used in chapter three at the start of the fight, um, even if I've only got one hand. So the constant references to Lenny's height show the insecurity that's always with Curly and that the revenge here is for his hand, not for the death of his wife, even if I've only got one hand. So what his, in his intention is to kill, Lenny, uh, to kill Lenny and his motivation, it's a personal thing. It's not about his wife. It's about his hand. So this revenge is his revenge that he's been waiting on from chapter three, not from chapter five. And he is going to get it in the way that will cause the most destruction possible. I'm going to shoot the guts. Three times he said that now. I'm going to shoot the guts. So... If we think about whether Curly wins, what he wants to do, three times he's made it apparent that he wants to shoot the guts out of Lenny. Does he? No, he doesn't. Because Lenny has somebody who loves and cares for him and he's going to deny Curly that pleasure. Okay, so this is the last time <clears throat> that we see or hear of Curly and it's at the end of chapter six. Now, remember, Curly has been motivated um, by the fact that that Lenny attacked his hand, that Lenny squeezed his hand and broke his hand. So as Slim made apparent in chapter five that Curly is acting out of revenge because he's still mad about his hand. Slim understood that. So his revenge is based on his own ego, um, his own sense. It's a personal motivation. He wants to make Lenny suffer for the attack, not only on his physicality, but the attack on his, him psychologically, the fact that he broke his hand 
Um, and Curly has only ever had his hands. Remember, Curly's pretty handy. It's the only weapon of power that he's ever had. It's the only weapon he's had. It's the only thing that he's had that can command respect from others. But remember, it's not respect if you're scared of the person, really, is it? So anyway, the group burst into the clearing and Curly was ahead. He saw Lenny lying on the sand, got him by God. He went over and looked down at Lenny and then he looked back at George, right in the back of the head, he said softly. And that's the last thing that Curly says because the next person to speak is Carlson. So the idea of um, the idea of the gun and um, that what's, what... Um, um, George says to lie and cover his tracks that Lenny had the gun. All of that is through is a conversation that that George has with Carlson. How um, had he your gun? I and he says, yeah, he had your gun, and you got him, and you got it away from him, and you took it, and and you killed him. Yeah, that's how. And George's voice was almost a whisper. Um, the idea that, that George lies there to, to protect himself, and that's the first time that George ever does lie to protect himself. All through the novella, he's been lying to protect Lenny. Uh, but Curly doesn't speak then after. It's it's Carlson who says, now what the hell you suppose is eating them two guys? It's Carlson that says that, not Curly. So the last thing that we get from Curly is right in the back of the head, he said softly. And it's interesting because that adverb, softly, that's the first time a positive adverb like that has been associated with curly and that's that's an interesting point um because there's no softening in who curly is as a character this isn't an epiphany moment for curly where he suddenly realizes what a hideous creature he is it's nothing like that his voice is soft because perhaps he realized that the revenge that he was seeking, the suffering that he wanted to personally ensure Lenny felt has been denied him. George has taken over. George has controlled the situation. It's George's authority um, that created an ending that prevents Curly from from enjoying the, the torture of Lenny that he wanted to ensure uh, he personally uh, undertook. So maybe that adverb softly is suggesting... Mm -hmm a sense of ultimate disappointment for Curly because he didn't get what he wanted, which was to shoot the big guy in the guts. Okay, so that is Curly.